This is Duxford Aerodrome, home to a thriving part of Britain's Imperial War Museum. It's also the operational base of the beautifully restored Messerschmitt BF 109 Black 6, the only remaining Gustav or G variant still flying. On the 12th of July 1991, Black 6 arrived here from Benson Airfield to take its place in one of the world's foremost centres of aircraft restoration and preservation with over 130 flying and static aeroplanes on display, it's Europe's largest collection of its kind. Duxford's purpose as a living and working museum is to preserve for us now and for future generations historic aircraft like Black Six. We preserve old aircraft because they can help us interpret to future generations the history of warfare in the 20th century. And our job is just to show what happened tell what happened, uh, and let people come to their own conclusions, uh, not, so not glorify it. These six hangars contain Black Six's stable books, veteran aircraft from every major conflict in the 20th century. Many survived combat and then years of neglect before being brought here for restoration. Chris Chippington, the museum's conservation manager, coordinates this work. I'm responsible for the, the preservation of all the uh, exhibits which belong to the museum here on site at Duxford. We have to make the distinction between uh, restoration and conservation. Um, restoration is restoring it back to a condition that it was in previously. Uh, conservation is uh, trying to conserve it, maintain it in its existing state. As far as this particular aircraft is concerned, um, it's the only um, currently flying German World War II aircraft in its original condition. Being able to include Black Six as an exhibit on the museum site is only one side of the story. Operating such a unique aircraft is the responsibility of airfield manager David Henshaw. Well, I think it actually works quite well. Um, Ministry of Defence are responsible, having given us a signed agreement, that their main responsibility to the aeroplane uh, is to supply us with pilots. Russ's team are entirely re responsible for the engineering uh, backup and support. My job in the Imperial War Museum's job is first of all to get the bookings, to do the administrative side of the air display work that the aircraft gets involved in, or to basically to market it I guess. Uh, we look after the insurance uh, and uh, we pay the bills, but then on the other side of the coin we take the money. Duxford's responsibility is now to care for and to operate Black 6 until the expiry of the agreement with the MOD. But how this aircraft came to be restored, so authentically and to flying condition, is Russ Snadden's story. I looked at this thing and I thought, well, if anybody was going to ask, which they did, like the Chief of Air Staff in his official visits, how long is it going to take Snadden? I say, casually, five years. I've since come to regret that little statement. The history of Black Six can't be fully understood without first gaining some realisation of the development and historical background of rearmament in post-World War I Germany. Basically, the 1990 Treaty was, was the, the treaty that limited German operations after the war. They permitted them to have a certain amount of civil aviation, um, 
and uh, gliding was permitted and things like that, but all military aircraft were either destroyed or handed over to the Allies. They reached an agreement, I think it was in 1923, with the Soviet government. And the Soviet government permitted them to have, obviously, clandestine training uh, base, I think about 200 miles east of Moscow. Uh, and that's where they, for about nine years, from 24 onwards, they actually trained uh, pilots, observers, engineers. In Germany itself, the main training role was with gliders. There was about 50,000 people that were it formed part of the gliding school by about 1929. And there was literally there was thousands of people that were trained to fly gliders and then could also be developed on to fly uh, high-performance aircraft. Lufthansa were using and designing uh, aircraft that could have a dual purpose. Uh, the Dornier 17 and the Heinkel 11, the two leading German bombers of the early part of the war, both were developed as high-speed mail planes and passenger-carrying aircraft. Uh, this Junkers 52 that we're standing beside was originally designed as an airliner, single-engine airliner, and put, fitted with three motors, and it was used as a bomber. The only type of aircraft to allow to be designed and built in Germany also trained very many people to fly. So the, by the time 1935 came around and the German Air Force was officially unveiled, um, there were something like 20,000 men that were able to serve. On the 10th of March, 1935, an interview with Goering was printed in the British press. He stated, It is not the creation of an offensive weapon threatening other nations, but rather a military aviation strong enough to repulse attacks on Germany. Germany was still prohibited from having a military air force, but I think a lot of people realise that it, it and doubt was going on in places such as Duxford had been redeveloped uh, in 1929 and, and in the early 30s because we'd begun to recognise that Germany was going to be a potential threat. Plenums and hurricanes, like these beautifully restored examples from the Duxford-based Aircraft Restoration Company and the Sea Hurricane Team, were growing in number here in Britain. In Germany, the newly formed Luftwaffe had settled on one design as their frontline fighter. The BF-109 was the brainchild of Willy Messerschmitt. The German Air Ministry issued a specification for a monoplane fighter to replace their biplanes. And there were four that were submitted. The Arado and the Focke-Wulf were fairly quickly eliminated from the competition as being not, not likely to be suitable. But the Heinkel and the Messerschmitt were both given a development contract for ten prototype aircraft. And, in fact, many people in Germany, I think, thought at the time the Heinkel was more advanced, uh, was a, a potentially greater more suitable aircraft. I think partly because Heinkel had greater experience in building military aircraft. Don't get Willy Messerschmitt had never built a military aircraft, uh, apart from his uh, Messerschmitt 108, which was really a communications aircraft. So they, they, they was a bit of a long shot to go for this untried designer. Um, certainly proved to be correct, with 33,000 Messerschmitt 109s being built. The Spanish Civil War was to be the proving ground for the Luftwaffe. In the late, late, late stages of 1936, the Condor Legion was formally formed. And the Germans unashamedly used the Spanish Civil War as a development, play face of development of their aircraft and their tactics. Uh, and so they, they really had a, a, a big step in advance of the rest of the world when the Second World War broke out, because they, they'd proved most of their current frontline aircraft in service in combat. In total, over 30,000 109s of different marks were built. The type remained in service for 30 years and saw combat in every theatre of World War II and beyond. The last 109s to retire were the Bouchons, like this one, restored by the old flying machine company in German markings, Merlin engine Messerschmitts that saw service up until the 1960s and beyond. In September 1942, this Messerschmitt was just one of the many to come off the production line of the Erler Maschinenwerk near Leipzig. The fact that we know this, and almost all of Black Six's history from that date, is a further tribute to Russ Snadden and the 109 team's attention to detail. Well, tracing the history was a... A start at it. We had no idea where the aircraft was captured or, or its, its Luftwaffe history. Russ knew that this 109 had been operated by 1426 enemy aircraft flight at Collie Weston during 1944. This rare archive 
shows it in flight during evaluation tests. But the supposed story of its capture left Russ with many doubts. And the official tale was that it had been captured in Sicily in 1943, I think it was, and I could find no records at all of that, that being so. It was unlikely that such an early 109 G2 as this would have been in Sicily at that time, when the more heavily armed G6 was in service at the fall of the island. The sand we found in the thing indicated it was probably in the desert. We found lots of sand in the wings and in the wheel well doors and all that sort of thing. So it had to be the North African desert. In November 1976, a photograph appeared in Air International magazine, submitted by Group Captain Keith Isaacs of the Royal Australian Air Force. His letter revealed that this 109 was flown by squadron leader Bobby Gibbs at Gambut, Cyrenaica. This was the first breakthrough in the search for Black Six's true history. But not only that, I found a chap who had captured the aircraft, who is retired now and lives in Sydney. And through him and through establishing contact with him, I came out with several photographs from his album and it established beyond doubt that it was our aircraft. Having established the point in time at which the aeroplane fell into Allied hands, it was then possible to start piecing together its history, first in North Africa and then in England. On the 13th of November, 1942, Flight Lieutenant Ken McRae, Engineering Officer, 3 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, discovered Black Six where it had been left by the retreating Germans on Gambit Main Airfield. He reported it as shot up with damage to tailwheel, tailplane, canopy and one propeller blade. Radio, oxygen unserviceable and some instruments missing. The following day, repairs were carried out and three squadron marking CVV, the personal codes of Bobby Gibbs were applied in readiness for his first flight in the 109G on the 15th. Gibbs flew Black Six to Gazala Satellite and on to Martuba on the 19th, escorted, as all captured aircraft had to be, by two Kitty Hawks. He was obviously impressed by the 109. His diary reads, the 109 is a hell of a nice kite with a terrific performance. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians, all from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of ancient Pompeii and the mystery of the princes in the tower to the life of Anne Boleyn and D-Day. Sign up via the link in the description. Bobby's plan was to ship his 109 back to Australia as a war trophy, but his prize was required elsewhere for performance and evaluation trials. This was the first serviceable BF 109G to be captured, and at that time it was outclassing all the opposition, including the Spitfire 5. And following an order from AOC, he delivered it to Heliopolis. There, an engineering attachment of 451 Squadron, Royal Australian Air Force, took charge of the BF 109G. On the 15th of December 1942, Group Captain Mungo Buxton flew the 109 to Lydda, Palestine, for evaluation tests. It remained there until it was ferried to Kasferit for tactical trials. Black Six's last recorded flight at Kasferit was a mock dogfight with a Spitfire 5C on the 24th of February 1943. Sometime after that, the station salvage section prepared and packed the 109 for shipment to England. On the 26th of December 1943, a very badly damaged packing case containing the 109 arrived with 1426 enemy aircraft flight at Collie Weston. Apart from a missing propeller, the 109 was, to quote Lofty Westwood, fitter 2A, very untidy and damaged due to bad handling and crating in an unsuitable crate. After several weeks plundering parts from other captured and crashed 109s, ground runs were completed, and the aeroplane was redesignated Romeo November 228. On the 19th of February 1943, RN228 made its first flight from Collie Weston, flown by Flight Lieutenant Lou Lewenden, seen here with Doug Goff, another of the 109's pilots whose name appears often in 1426's log. 
RN228 spent the rest of the war with 1426 flight. This film, found in the Imperial War Museum archive, is now one of the rarest records of Black Six's Royal Air Force career. RN228's main roles with 1426 were photographic sessions, evaluation tests, and tactical trials against Allied aircraft. But as Russ Snadden explains, in 1944, it was put to a new use. Towards the end of the war to show, <coughs> particularly the Americans, how to disable aircraft that they would come across in Germany without ruining them, basically. Right. So if they showed them a particular part of a German aircraft that they could immobilize, that would stop it being operational. Uh, the idea being subsequently if any evaluation teams came over any aircraft which was perhaps interesting, then with a minimum of rectification, they could get it flying again. 109 flew a tour of American and British airfields in this new route during 1944 and continued flying sporadically due to periods of unserviceability up until March 1945, when Doug Goff flew RN-228 for the last time from Collie Weston to Tangmere, following the disbandment of the 1426 flight in January. Russ now knew Black Six's history in Allied hands, but his ambition was to restore this aircraft as authentically as possible, with its original equipment, camouflage, markings and insignia. During many hours of research at the Public Records Office, a document emerged that revealed the original German serial number, 10639. Andy Stewart of British Aerospace, who'd helped Russ in the past, then took up the search through the Bundes archive in Koblenz. The information they supplied corresponded with Allied records of the capture of the 109 and established the Luftwaffe history of Black Six. Having left the Erler Maschinenwerk in Leipzig, work number 10639 was accepted by the Luftwaffe on the 13th of October 1942 and collected by three Jagdschwader 77 at Munchenriem Airfield. From here it was flown to northern Italy en route to North Africa. Lieutenant Heinz Ludemann was a young pilot who trained with the Luftwaffe during 1941. In 1942, he was on active service in Russia, flying this BF-109F with the 8th Squadron of the 77th Fighter Group. In Luftwaffe terms, 8 Staffel Jagdschwader 77. Heinz's tour of duty in Russia lasted until mid-October 1942, when his unit was withdrawn from the Eastern Front for redeployment to the desert. They flew their BF-109s to Munich, and after some home leave, collected their new BF-109 Gustavs to follow the route through Italy to North Africa. Heinz normally flew Black 4, but it's quite possible that Black 6 flew with his unit to the desert. Black 4 was unserviceable, and Heinz flew Black 6 in combat with P-40 Kitty Hawks, similar to this example from the fighter collection. According to Ludemann's diary, he sustained slight injuries to his head and body during this action, but he managed to return Black Six to the airfield at Cote Fire, leaving it there and continuing by road west, only just ahead of the Allied breakthrough at El Alamein. Black Six was ferried by an unknown pilot to Gambit Airfield, 200 miles away, for repair. But the Allied advance was too swift, and it was abandoned following the removal of vital equipment. Heinz Ludemann was killed in combat with P-40s over Tunisia on the 10th of March, 1943. His nephew, Heinz Langer, attended the rollout ceremonies in May 1991 at Benson and gave an account of his uncle's career before presenting Russ Snadden with two of his uncle's medals. Black Six is, as it was when Heinz Ludemann last flew it in combat, an accurate restoration of an Axis fighter in the desert campaign but in its post-war life it suffered from several, as Russ describes them, very imaginative paint jobs which were applied for appearances on Horse Guards Parade during Battle of Britain Week. In 1961, the BF-109G went to Wattisham, where a proposed rebuild was started by one of the flight lieutenants stationed there. His idea was to restore the thing to flight, uh, only he was going to do it in six months, you know. 
Uh, that puts the whole thing in perspective, really. Uh, he was going to fly it with bolted, the legs bolted down with a big bar between them to hold it down. He was going to throw all the, in which he subsequently did, he threw all the German instrumentation in a panelling away and put in a basic piece of aluminium with basic British instruments in it. Suffice to say, after some months, he put it to the board uh, to assess his board at whichever command it was in these days. And they said, no way, sunshine, and put it back together again the way you got it. The 109 returned to static display, having spent a further ten years appearing in various fictional guises at open days around the country. On the 30th of September, 1972, Russ Madden inherited the BF 109 G2 that we now know as Black 6. Its arrival at Lynham marked the end of Russ Madden's search for a suitable aircraft to restore and the start of 22 years hard labour for Russ and his team. I'd been involved in preservation for 20 years, for 20 years by that stage. Firstly, through one of the first preservation societies in the country, Historic Aircraft Preservation Society which is sadly gone now, but we managed to save lots of aircraft like Lancaster, Walrus, Corsair, Seafire, Sabre, all through donations from the people who owned these things. Uh, it's changed days now, they cost a fortune, but in these days people were glad to get rid of them. But that fell asunder when I was uh, with the service in Singapore. But then I found myself on the Comet Squadron at Lynham, and the lifestyle there was such that you would go around the world for about two weeks, three weeks and have a similar amount of time in between trips. So I thought I could make use of this time and restore an old aircraft. And the 109, I have to say, wasn't my first target. Uh, my first target was a Fokker Wolf 190, which uh, is still one of my favorite aircraft today. First I saw of it, uh, it was at RAF Lynham, where I was stationed. Um, and it had been delivered from RAF Watersham in uh, Suffolk in the back of two Hercules transport aircraft. One Hercules brought back the uh, fuselage complete with propeller, and the other one brought a pair of wings back. And the first I knew of it was um, a little corporal in the customs shed ringing me at my quarters uh, on the base saying, do you know anything about a Messerschmitt 109, sir? <laughs> to be perfectly candid, I'd only seen the pictures of the aircraft. I'd never actually seen the aircraft myself. And it looked, sorry, dilapidated, but nothing irrecoverable, I thought. Inside it had been totally gutted. There was nothing really of use inside the aeroplane at all. The engine was in a sorry state, externally at least. Lots of bolts were missing, pipes were bent, damaged, broken. Um, undercarriage legs, sort of both deflated. Well, one was deflated and the other was up, so it was sitting with a terrible lopsided attitude to it. The more I got into it, the more despondent I became. I felt like ringing waters and saying, can you take it back, please? Unbeknown to Russ, Ian Mason had already made his first contact with the BF-109. I was corporal in charge of duty crew when one of the lads came up and said, there's some idiot's got an ancient aeroplane down at movements and we've got to go and get it and shove it up the pan. So in actual fact, I was one of the people who pushed it in the hangar when it arrived from Watershed. And it went in circles all the time. You had to push it for about 50 feet, then drag the tail sideways, then push it again, because one leg was completely collapsed and the other one was still hanging on to a bit of pressure. Uh, and at that point was when you start, became aware of bits of brown paper stuffed in the wing roots and uh, cardboard fairings held on with self-tapping screws. And so, yeah, it was in a pretty bad shape. Having got his 109 and survived the initial shock, Russ started work. So my primary intention was to restore it as accurately as I could. Uh, the secondary thing was just a little thought in the back of my head that if we found it was OK, why not fly it? Because there wasn't one flying. But the next stage really was to investigate um, all the damage and what we could do with it and all the rest of it. But at this stage, having cleaned the fuselage down and looked at the very superficial corrosion we'd got rid of, it all looked nice, and suddenly the, the rug was pulled from under, and 216 Squadron disbanded, and I was faced with a move somewhere. I knew North Holt of old. It's a tiny little airfield with not a lot of hangarage and lots of aeroplanes, and I thought, my chances of shoehorning even a small Messerschmitt 109 there must be remote. Mm. And I was very surprised contacting the, both the station commander and the engineering officer said, bring it along, we'll put it in somewhere. I wasn't particularly happy, I didn't particularly like Bryce. And... Uh, I got a phone call one day from a squadron leader at MOD saying, did I know a flight lieutenant Snadden? Yeah. And did I wish to continue working on the 109? Yeah. 
So you'd be happy with a posting to Northolt, certainly. He's very persistent, very good at his letter writing. Russograms are called in the trade. <laughs> Ian and Russ had spent most of their spare time at Lynham cleaning and preparing the Gustav. It looked lovely at this stage. Um, that was the fuselage. The fuselage had been done. One wing had been done externally. The other wing we hadn't touched. Um, the engine by this stage had gone to Rolls-Royce at Bristol Fulton just down the road. They volunteered to have a look at it for us. By this time, Russ and his 109 were becoming well known. But how did the Royal Air Force regard the project? and its use of official space and equipment. I only agreed to take the aircraft on, provided everybody stayed out of my hair. I wasn't having anyone breathing over my shoulder every inconvenient moment, and also that they put no time limit on it, because uh, having been involved in restoring aircraft in the past to a, a more superficial degree, anything that you reckon might take two days generally took a week. So as a result of that, I'm glad to say that they, both the MOD and the Air Force uh, from a higher level kept out of my way. There tended to be a bit of uh, interference, basically because, of course, we were using hangar space, which really should have been used to service the operational air aircraft of that station and not restore a museum airplane. I could see the point of view. It was irritating, nevertheless. Having established my ground rules, the other side of the coin was they established their ground rules. The coin's an appropriate phrase, come to think of it. And that was that uh, they would have they would give no public funds towards the restoration. Anything that had, was done had to be done voluntarily and by uh, people giving their time and parts and all the rest of it, uh, which didn't bother me at the time. But then, as I said to you, um, having seen inside the aircraft and seen just how much was missing, uh, then it started to worry. <laughs> Ian's not known for his gift of the gab, but somehow he managed to win over about three of his team members uh, on the south side of the airfield. He was responsible for seeing in and servicing to a minor degree the uh, visiting aircraft and uh, he managed to cajole them into coming along to have a look at the 109 and fortunately out of the three two became regular members of the team for a couple of years and that really did help. Up until 1977 the team were fitted in to the hangars at Northolt but then very suddenly they were ordered to move out. Their new accommodation Came as a shock. Uh, the medieval conditions we had at Northolt. We were in a little blister Nissen hut, which really couldn't be termed a hangar in any sense of the word. There was no heating, very few, little lighting. No water, no toilet facilities. Holes in the roof. Now I'm well out of the Air Force, I can probably say we got our electricity by opening a fuse box, putting 100 yards of cable, shoving the leads into the fuses, bang the fuse back into position, switch the fuse box back on and run everything off the one lead. Despite the problems, Work progressed over the next few years, cleaning and assessment of the fuselage and wings reached completion, and reconstruction started. The fuselage was now complete, with tail and front bulkhead, all painted in the original primer, identified and found by Russ after much research. The team now turned its attention to the wings. Although these had passed non-destructive testing, along with the main spar, the D-frames and the tail, they still required a lot of attention. An addition to the team in 1978 was John Elkham. I was officially invited in by Ian after he'd seen me photographing the Gate Guardian Spitfire. He said, do you want to come and photograph a real aeroplane? So I said, what it, why? What have you got? And he said, a Messerschmitt 109. You'd have to, I would have thought, been a really knowledgeable person to recognise the piece of metal that I saw. It was just a bare rubbed down fuselage which was firewall to just before the tail where the tail disconnects and I'd no sooner said there's anything you want clean while I'm here I've got you know Sundays the whole day off I'm not doing anything and scotch brights in the hand and there's a piece of pipe given to me before I knew what had happened sort of thing and it went on from there literally. Availability of bits was sometimes something that you thought will, you know, will we ever find whatever. It wasn't a case of knowing that there was a bit missing and going to the local store and buying it. That was almost like an act of faith. You just carried on doing something else and, and hoped to God it would turn up by the time you got stuck. And, and luckily, basically, it always did. One source of parts was the Swiss Air Force, who, together with Pilatus, had developed the P2 trainer from their stock of redundant 109Es. I contacted them and they said, well, you'll have to make an official uh, approach for that and offer something in exchange. Well, I could offer anything in exchange. 
And I approached the RAF Museum and said, look, can you help? And fortunately, it all worked because before that, the Swiss Air Force had given the RAF Museum a uh, de Havilland Venom fighter, and in exchange for which the RAF gave very little, and they felt guilty about it at the time. So this was an opportunity to redress the balance, and they found what the Swiss particularly wanted, which was a, a Napier Sabre engine. And that was stuck in a crate sent to Switzerland, and in exchange we got three crates of spares back, which included a complete set of undercarriage legs from the Pilatus P2, rudder pedals, all the hydraulics we wanted, tires, wheels, brakes, everything we really, it was Christmas come early that year, I tell you. He's a tremendous scrounger, beggar, and uh, writer of letters. Um, he's got things that I regularly thought there's no way. Uh, and he's turned up and eventually got what he was after. He's, he's very persistent. In 1980, Russ's commission came to an end. So, uh, technically, I was still in charge. Um, but of course, I now live something like an hour and a half's drive away. So it made it not very easy to, to work on the aircraft or even to coordinate the work that was being done. But on top of that, Ian Mason, because uh, the Falklands, uh, well, this was after I left the Air Force, but Ian Mason left to go down to Ascension Island when the Falklands crisis blew up, so I lost him subsequently. And the members of the team that we had gathered together in the years at Northolt, they left, uh, one on posting, the other one into Civvy Street. So slowly the team went down to virtually nothing again, really. And also at that stage, um, interests were being shown. Um, I shouldn't go into too much detail, but there were various senior officers who were starting to take a, an inordinate interest in a 109, which everybody ignored for 30 odd years before. People who were obviously trying to uh, hijack the project is one that always sticks in your mind. There was a lot of interest there. So subsequently, um, I was summoned to uh, the station commander's office and told that I'd have to move the aeroplane. Uh, whether the two were connected, I know not. Um, but at that stage, the squadrons at Northolt were re-equipping or getting more equipment, and space at, in hangars was becoming more and more scarce. In July 1983, the 109 was on the move again, this time to Royal Air Force Benson in Oxfordshire, its third home in ten years. I was given about five weeks to get it off the station, and during that five weeks I heard that uh, we could have space at Benson. I then went to the station commander, who I thought was a nice friendly officer until about then, and asked for a Queen Mary, one of these long articulated trucks, to take the aircraft to Benson. And eventually I was offered a, a three-ton truck and a trailer. I dreaded what might arrive at the other end, I might add, because I could see all sorts of things happening en route and, and offloading, but there was really little damage at all. Ian, by the stage, uh, had long since left us because of his postings in the Air Force and all the rest of it. Um, I managed to uh, induce, cajole, interest some other people in the new hangar I was in. And uh, the first of those was a chief technician called John Dixon. First I knew about it, it was planted in the hangar outside the, the little beer where uh, I worked. And the, um, the undercarriage legs were the first thing we worked on. And I said, yeah, certainly, Russ. And he, he showed me what he had, was which, uh, which were um, two original legs off the aircraft, which were supposedly serviced and capable of uh, holding oil and, and air, you know. And when we tried that, it all ran out the bottom. <laughs> and he had another set of legs off a Pilatus aircraft, which are exactly the same, licensed, built by the Swiss. So we had spare legs to play with and look at, and uh, we took it from there. Uh, we resealed the legs, put oil in them, charged them up, and whoopee, we got them to all the oil and put the air in, and we had a fully serviceable set of legs. Some weeks later, a corporal called Paul Blacker took an interest. He was an air friend's man, magic with his hands. And I just went along, introduced myself, asked him if I could do anything, and he said, yeah, help yourself. <laughs> so I, I picked the, the grossest looking parts on the rack and took them away came back days later with them totally rebuilt, which astonished us at the time. And I just took more and more panels away. And then just as he came in sort of week after week, there were more and more restored bits on his rack waiting to go on the aircraft. And they'd become two firm members of the team. Um, sometime afterwards, and well into the time when the aircraft was really starting to take shape again, <coughs> Ian Mason turned up 
at Benson on his last posting before leaving the Air Force. It's a tradition in the service that uh, you're given a choice of your last posting. And I walked in the hangar door and basically slap bang in front as I walked in through the hangar door with my arrival card in my hand is a 109. Having found a reasonably safe haven and a new team for his Y9, the next few years saw some incredible progress. We were there until uh, we moved the airplane, which was in 90, was well, 10 years basically. Just under 10 years. Time flies when you're having fun. Physically, there was no reason why it shouldn't fly. All through the restoration, we hadn't found anything, really, that would stop it flying. It was in, although it looked horrible when I got it, uh, physically it was in good shape. Um, we had to do very little repair to the airframe to make it ready. It was merely a, a task of finding all the bits that were required to restore the thing properly. The first system we had serviceable, which I'm uh, thinking about it now, was the, the brake system, which followed from hitting the legs. And it's a very simple system, um, a static line braking system, hydraulic, just like you have on your car. And from there, we fitted the wings. It's been actually putting them on the airframe. Fantastic. Putting the wings on. I've never seen an aircraft with its wings on. It arrived in the back of Hercules with wings in one and fuselage in the other. And, uh, of course, the two were never mated. Seeing one wing on, and then about a couple of months later, seeing the other wing on. Started getting the controls to operate up and down, you know, getting the range of movement. And it was good, you know, from there it sort of blossomed forth. By February 1988, the airframe was largely rebuilt, ready to accept the contents of the Rolls-Royce lorry that arrived at Benson. This great big yellow box turning up. Uh, when we sort of took the lid off, inside was this gleaming engine. And this rather delightful piece of engineering appeared out of this box, glistening, you know, lovely gloss black. Very nice gleaming, sparkling, shiny engine. And then we had to sort of hold back for about two months before we actually fitted it. And that was the next major uh, step, seeing the engine on. First time in 40 odd years. Uh, an engine had been fitted on the 109. We looked at it for a while and then hung it on the front and we were quite surprised at how much bigger the, the aircraft looked at, you know, with the engine on the front. And we had the propeller back from Germany and that was mounted and it's a nice big nine foot propeller and it was beginning to look like a real aeroplane there and uh, these were big milestones to us. In the eight years reconstruction at Benson, the BF 109 G2 gradually changed into what we know today was black six. The team was joined in 1990 by Chris Starr, who had a special interest in large piston engines. I was passing through Benson and heard about it, and I got a, an interest in older aircraft and engineering, and popped down the hangar and saw John Dixon. I was looking for something to do, actually. I was looking to be involved, so it was quite uh, a bit of providence there that um, I discovered the, uh, the 109 project, which really fitted my interests. The piston engine particularly has got a soul and a history, especially the Second World War, big engines. And uh, the technical aspects of the, of the Mercedes really are complex, uh, they're intriguing, and um, that's really why I've uh, centred on the engine. Also, the airframe was well looked after by John Dixon and Paul Blacker, particularly. Uh, the airframe work was mainly complete when I bumped into the project. By July 1990, the aircraft was almost complete and ready for its first engine run. Yes, we have this dream scenario that you work on this lovely old aircraft and you push it out and it's such a gentle little beast that when you push the appropriate switches and pull the appropriate toggles, it will immediately fire into life because it's nice that way. Um, we couldn't even get the thing to talk to us. Uh, we, the engine and the, the, Daim the Daimler Benz engine in the 109 is started by hand cranking a flywheel and then the guy in the cockpit pulls switches and makes the magneto switches and all the rest of it and introduces the fuel of course and then hopefully everything comes together and it fires. Now we couldn't even get the propeller to turn the initial and it was so frustrating it's untrue. We used to take it out quite regularly and try and get it to start and it wouldn't start uh, <laughs> and then change plugs, look at the wiring. And there was weekend upon weekend upon weekend uh, during the summer of 1990 that we all turned up, all optimistic that this was the day the engine was going to fire and we couldn't even get the thing to cough. I think we just about given up all hope of it starting. It was about half past four, one wet and windy afternoon. It was coming to near dusk 
and I was absolutely shattered, as was the rest of the team. But we got this little cough. The propeller kicked, and I thought, well, that's a sign of life. And I think there was a puff of smoke out of one of the cylinder stubs, exhaust stubs. But I was so shattered, I thought, right, OK, we're getting somewhere. Call it a day. We'll pack it in and go home. And I was shouted down by about six other members of the team. In fact, I'm surprised I survived the event, actually. I was nearly lynched, suggesting that we pack up, put it in the hangar and go home. And we persevered for about another half hour, and nothing happened, really, uh, despite many attempts. Uh, we tried one more go, and lo and behold, it fired. And I couldn't believe it. It was several seconds before I sort of regained sanity and started doing the job I was supposed to be doing, which was looking over Roger's shoulder into the cockpit at the instruments and seeing that everything was tickety-boo. Uh, it wasn't, but uh, nothing drastic. But having congratulated each other, I thought, well, perhaps it's a fluke, so we'll start it again. And we tried again, and it coughed, and I thought, here we go again. And after the second go, it fired, and we did another run. No leaks to speak of, no nothing, and we went home thoroughly delighted, thinking we're making progress. Little did we know it would take us several months later to get the thing to run the way it should run. It was to take a further eight months of testing and adjustment before the first flight could be made on the 17th of March, 1991. Well, the obvious uh, thing, of course, is who was going to fly it. There's a chap called Reg Hallam, who was group captain in charge of experimental flying at Farnborough, RAE Farnborough at the time, who uh, was not only highly qualified, Empire Test Pilot qualified, etc., but actually flew Spitfires and Mustangs and the Hispano 1112, which is the Spanish-built version of the aircraft with a Merlin engine on the front. So I th first, of course, called him at home and suggested that he might like to fly the only 109 flying in the world. And the, uh, there was no hesitation whatsoever. He said, yes, please. The day it flew, of course, well, to be honest, it shouldn't have done on the day. It was a fairly yucky day and a bad strip. About a month before, uh, Benson had a little radar station put in and they dug up the grass strip and put a trench across it. The pilot had looked at it and he thought it was, uh, you know, good enough to uh, have a go at. So Le Reg, bless his heart, decided to uh, take off. But the takeoff itself, well, that was something else. <laughs> <laughs> there was a row of about five of us videoing this thing, and mine was the only camera that kept working. And so I got the only footage there was of the actual first takeoff. The tail came up very quickly indeed, and I think it's fair to say within a few yards of it moving forward. I had full right rudder on to try and hold the aircraft. That didn't help. He had full right brake on, and that didn't help. And then he hit the first trench. And as he went over it, it sunk in, knocked him off about 40 degrees. I thought it was going to end up in a little heap at the end of the grass. I turned away. Uh, just didn't watch. The blade touched the ground and then he got airborne. And launched into the air Harrier style and Reg, uh, with all his expertise, managed to hold it there and pull it away. I thought we were going to have a smoking heap at the end of the day, but uh, Reg got it airborne. The next remark I had from him was over a little radio I had, Russ, goes like a train. The amazing thing after that was, as we subsequently found the propeller was damaged, is the way for 30 minutes, it whipped about the skies, no problem at all. Uh, and he was very impressed with the performance. The heart was going, I don't know what rate, but ever so glad that it got airborne. Uh, but we had all sorts of little problems in the flight, and all of which was rectified later. When he came back down, he got out, and how did it go? And his first words were, it goes like a train. After that, uh, the propeller had to be repaired, or replaced, and I didn't think there was any chance of replacing it. So eventually it was shipped to Hoffmann Propellerwerk at, uh, in Germany, and they very kindly uh, straightened it for us and repainted it for us, and this was all done within the space of a few working days. But uh, we had other problems, because uh, having got the propeller back, we discovered that uh, a couple of the exhaust valves in the engines had burned through. We had hoped at the official rollout ceremony, which had then been planned by Ministry of Defence, that we could fly it for the invited guests, some of whom, of course, were coming from Australia. But that was out the window. The rollout ceremony had been scheduled for quite some time and couldn't be postponed. The team had to continue as planned with the preparation of the 109, although on the day it was only to be seen on static display. Russ's detailed research into the origins of his 109 were now being proved. The exact camouflage, markings and insignia that had been displayed on Heinz Ludemann's Black Six 49 years before were restored in every detail. On the 2nd of May, 1991, Black Six went on public view for the first time. 
The rollout ceremony was attended by many distinguished guests from the aircraft's past. Heinz Langer, nephew of Heinz Ludemann, the last Luftwaffe pilot to fly Black Six, who presented Russ with two of his uncle's decorations. Bobby Gibbs, the man who claimed his Gustav in 1942 as an Australian war trophy and had to give it up to the Royal Air Force. Doug Goff, pilot of the BF 109 G2 during its time with 1426 enemy aircraft flight. Following the rollout, Russ and the team rectified the engine problems in readiness for flight. During this time, Russ had been negotiating with the MOD, the agreement under which Black Six now operates at Duxford. I first ordered Benson before its first uh, air test, uh, and it struck me then, uh, in fact it hadn't even been finally, hadn't got its top coat of paint on, it was still in, in undercoat primer, uh, but it struck me then that it was a very uh, professional and painstaking rebuild uh, by guys who not only knew what they were doing, but loved what they were doing. I knew there was a, a 109 uh, undergoing restoration. Uh, yes, I think it was, from my point of view anyway, um, a bit of a surprise when we were asked to uh, uh, take over the operation of the aeroplane. Having given the undertaking to the people who rebuilt it, i.e. Russ and his team, uh, that they would fly it, uh, given that it was got back into flying condition, uh, the Air Force Board uh, considered that A, they had no funds to fly within the Air Force, it also wasn't appropriate for a former enemy aircraft to be tacked onto the back end of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, and so they had to find uh, some instrument whereby the aircraft could find a home where it would be well looked after uh, and where it could actually fly in a meaningful sort of way for a period. And the Imperial War Museum was that instrument, really. On the 12th of July, 1991, the Gustav took off from Benson Airfield for the last time and flew to its present home, the Imperial War Museum at Duxford. Black Six completed its test flights at Duxford and flew in its first public display in September 1991. Russ's ambition was to return this aircraft to the condition it was in when Heinz Ludemann last flew it in 1942. The BF 109G continued to fly successfully from Duxford for the next two years. Charlie Brown, one of the three pilots rated on the aeroplane, flew it last in 1993. That was an air test, an annual air test, which was due. Um, everything, everything worked exactly according to plan. I first saw the 109 when it arrived from Benson uh, with John Allison at the controls after its, uh, I believe it was its second flight because Reg Hallam did the first and uh, was very excited by the aeroplane because it was absolutely authentic and original. I'd never seen a restoration like it. But it came about through John Allison really. John Allison's chief pilot with the aeroplane. Um, he decides exactly what's done and what isn't done with the aircraft. Um, the deputy pilot, if you like, is um, David Southwood, who's a test pilot. Um, one day, John Allison said to me, we'd actually been flying Spitfires together, would you like to fly the 109? And it was as simple as that. And I said, well, you can have the leg as well if you like. Unfortunately, the next time I went to fly it, we broke the, the starter dog on startup on the crankshaft, and so we had a protracted um, engine maintenance program during last year. The starter dog on the back of the crankshaft split. The only way you've got to start the aircraft is through that starter dog. It's not accessible without stripping down the whole of the engine effectively. Whilst we had the, the rear gearbox off to get the starter dog off, we decided that we would try and cure some of the oil leaks we've been having through the season. So we involved taking off the, uh, the blocks and the pistons. And when we took one of the blocks off, five of the rings were broken. So <laughs> that was a good start. We could do without that work. <laughs> During the winter, the engine had undergone an extensive rebuild and was reaching the final stages in the engine workshop. Effectively, the engine comes apart and the gearbox comes off the back, and all to change the starter drive. But these, these are problems that everybody seems to have with big pistol engines. Uh, they are labour intensive and they do go wrong relatively regularly, is my experience so far. This time, the airframe was in Hangar 2, awaiting the engine and final dressing. All the team members put in a lot of time, and uh, I think, like most. Most adult people, we have a, a train set to play with. This is my train set. Other people have golf. Well, some people really do have train sets. 
I have to balance it um, as best I can, but it does come down to my wife and uh, her, her level of understanding. If somebody had come up to me in 1972 and said, here's an aeroplane, it's going to cost you a fortune, you're going to be given absolutely no assistance and stuck in the most god-awful places and it'll take you 20 years, how about it? I'd have told them where to go and what to do with this out. Uh, well, I love it. <laughs> and uh, as of 90, October 93, I'm now a member of the Battle of Britain flight. During the week, I work on the BBMF, and at weekends, I work on the Messerschmitt. It doesn't leave me a lot of time to do anything else. <laughs> I think my wife has become used to me disappearing for a couple of days on end, but it's taken 20 years to get this far. <laughs> By the end of April, the engine and airframe were reunited, and the final dressing and assembly had begun in preparation for an engine run the following day. On the 1st of May, Black Six went out for the first engine run of the year. It was just possible that the 109 would take part in Duxford's D-Day air show, should all go well. At this point, a problem emerged. Fuel was leaking from the tank. It was too late to rectify it for the following day. Black Six sat out the air show while the team tried in vain to resolve their problem. The leak was to frustrate the team for several months to come, although several engine runs completed during May served to prove that the team's work on the engine had been successful. The fuel tank, though, after 50 years, proved to be irreparable. Russ and the team were faced with, at best, a long delay while funds were raised for a new tank, or at worst, the permanent grounding of the aeroplane and its return to static display at the Royal Air Force Museum in Hendon. I've always had a love of flying aeroplanes. To me, an aeroplane is, a historic aeroplane is a very attractive uh, thing to look at and to uh, appreciate, but you don't really get the full value of it until you see it in the air. Uh, so you can have a hall full of historic Spitfires, such as they've got at the Royal Air Force Museum at Hendon, uh, on all the Battle of Britain aircraft. They're very impressive, they're very uh, interesting, uh, particularly for people who have never seen them. But uh, they don't come alive until they get into their own environment. And the 109 were not that short of 109s. Yes, it's a fairly rare aeroplane, but there are no 109s flying. And we can afford to do it with one. We know the history. It should be up for the people to see. I'd like to see it carry on flying indefinitely, as long as the engine and as long as we can get spares for the engine or the airframe. It would be nice, I think, to keep it going until something else German or another 109 appears on the scene. And there's obviously work going in that direction now. There are a couple in the States being rebuilt to fly just now. But, uh... That's the sum total of it, and when you consider that over 30,000 of these were built in all its various configurations and, and forms, uh, and there's only that small number left, it's a very minute proportion of perhaps, uh, you know, one of the most important aircraft of all times. Having kept the team together for so long, what will they do if their aeroplane is taken away from them? I think we shall disperse, most likely, one way or another. We, we'd like to carry on been associated with Duxford, to be honest with you. I think if you're going to do a restoration, you restore it to how it was like, what it was like, and you overcome the problems to make it, you know, as original as you can. It requires a goal to keep people together, and the goal is this aeroplane, which isn't which isn't privately owned, which is mm -hmm. publicly owned. It's, it's, it's nobody's aeroplane. Nobody profits from our work except perhaps the Imperial War Museum. The future of Black Six and the team hung in the balance until early June, when funds were allocated by the Imperial War Museum for a replacement fuel tank. This has just been one more problem for Russ and his team to solve out of the many they've faced over 22 years. Russ has already achieved what no one else has. This is the only aircraft, original German combat aircraft from World War II flying anywhere in the world. It makes me feel very responsible, I think. But nonetheless, I, I thoroughly enjoy um, the flying of it. I feel that the aircraft um, should be flown in a responsible way, in that its needs should be catered for in terms of warming the engine, looking after the technical side of the aircraft. But nonetheless, it is a fighter, and it should be demonstrated in a spirited manner. There isn't anything there, so any sop to safety through the whole thing. It's designed to do its job. 
So that has to be borne in mind by people who fly these days. There is a train of thought which I can fully understand, which says, really, if you've got no experience in that, you don't want to risk damaging this aircraft. But there's the other side of me. I've been a professional pilot for 30 years now, and uh, I reckon I'm fairly competent. And given adequate, suitable training, at least uh, I think I should uh, have a go at it, shall I say. Uh, having said that, have, if I don't have a go at it, then I'll never forgive myself. I'll, I'll end up a bitter and twisted old man, wondering why after 20 odd years working on the aircraft, I didn't fly the thing that uh, I was responsible for uh, causing to be rebuilt. But my primary intention was to restore it as accurately as I could. Uh, the secondary thing was just a little thought in the back of my head that if we found it was okay, why not fly it?